we go to the heart of the matter tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. It seems like we have done a hundred shows about the heart and heart disease in the 13 seasons of On Call. What more can we say about this little pump we carry around in our chests? Well, it, as it turns out, it's, there's a lot to say. Every year we've learned a bit more of the intricacies of the operation of that wonderful muscle. We've refined the various methods of treatments required to keep it running. More importantly, we have lifestyle choices that each of us can employ to help keep the never-ending rhythm. It goes on and on, going strong for as long as we live. As usual, we'll, have an we'll answer your questions as they are called in. So call in early. But should there be questions, uh, more than we can answer during the, the show, we'll have time after the broadcast where we continue a live streaming on the internet uh, called After Hours in the After Hours portion of this evening. Call us at 1-888-376-6225 or email your questions to ask at oncalltv.org. You're the lifeblood of the show. It's your questions that matter. Please give us your calls. Tonight I'm joined by Dr. Raymond Allen and Dr. Jonathan Adams, who both practice at North Central Heart in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Thank you both for joining us. That's Ray, tell us a little bit about uh, where you were raised. That I heard you were raised in this fabulous town somewhere. I, I, where, where was that? Yeah, I think it was Brookings. Was it Brookings? Yeah. So. Yeah, so you grew up in Brookings. Grew up in Brookings, went to school in Brookings, high school, went to college in Vermilion. My folks, my brother went here, I went there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was, you know, taught here at the at State, and um, then I went to medical school in Vermilion. Did my medicine residency at Mayo in Rochester, and my cards in uh, Portland, Maine. Oh, yeah. And then I came back here. Yeah. To Sioux Falls. To Sioux Falls. And you've been practicing there since? 88. 1988. Wow. And tell me a little bit about yourself, Jonathan. So I grew up in Yankton, uh, went to college in Brookings here at South Coast. So State. you're an SDSU, yeah. you're a Jackrabbit. That's right, that's right. This, I hadn't been back in a while. <laughs> um, they've redone all the engineering halls. So I was an electrical engineering student here, and uh, it's beautiful, actually. Is what no wonder made. you're an electrical yeah. physiologist. <laughs> exactly. And then I went from here, I went to medical school at uh, University of South Dakota in Vermilion, did two years in, in Sioux Falls there. Spent some time with the guys at North Central Heart actually as a medical student. And then uh, went to internal medicine residency in Rochester, Minnesota, at Mayo Clinic. And then went to Mayo Clinic, Arizona and lived in Scottsdale for three years for cardiology. And then I went to moved to California, Palo Alto, for two years to do the electrophysiology fellowship at Stanford. So there's an extra, you're a fellow fellow. Yeah, two years actually. Yeah, yeah extra yeah. physiology. <clears throat> so, physiologist is what? Tell us a little. What is an EP, an electrophysiologist, cardiologist? So, electrophysiology focuses mostly. I mean, it's all heart rhythm related. So, like I've said before, heart's too fast, too slow, irregular, and we do lots. It's very procedural, um, and we use special drugs also um, to try to regulate the heart rate. You know, if it's too fast or irregular. But we do all kinds of things from pacemaker or defibrillator implantation to um, ablation procedures where we go and we try to map out the abnormal heart rhythm and then either cauterize it or freeze it to make the heart rhythm back to normal. So the heart rhythms uh, do weird things. You can map them out and freeze them. What weird things do those rhythms do? So the most common one is, is atrial fibrillation, as you know, uh, in the population. And we kind of know, well, we have, we have some standard ideas of where those abnormal rhythms come from. And uh, that one in particular comes from the left atrium, so we target areas in the left atrium. There's a whole different set of arrhythmias that could come from the lower chambers, for instance, uh, where we actually have to use special, you know, high-tech mapping navigation equipment to sort out where they're coming from. And we can narrow things down and identify those things and then ablate them. And then ablate them by buzzing Burn, them, burning them. Usually burning them, yeah. Oh. Burning them with a, it's like it's a radio frequency energy is yeah. what it is. Yeah. Oh. And I always thought that the 
uh, atrial fib was from the right side, you know, where the SA node, where the, the, the center of rhythm starts at the SA node, the sinoatrial node, which is, let's, let's look at this. Yeah. This is, show me where. Uh, so can I draw here then? Yeah. So the sinoatrial node is right up here. Maybe I'm, is it working? Try right this way. Side. All right, so come on, eraser there. Okay, do touch the green thing. Uh, we'll see what happens. Touch, yeah, there you go. So there is where the sinus, the sinoatrial node is. That's the body's um, biologic pacemaker, right. I'd like to say. But we think atrial fibrillation really comes from over here near these pulmonary veins where the blood drains from the lungs back into the left atrium. You can get these, there's little muscle fibers there that extend up into these veins where the vein met, meets up with the, uh, the heart, with the atrium of the left atrium. And those little muscle fibers, back when they first started doing AFib ablation, they would actually try to ablate in the vein. The problem was that you'd get scarring afterwards and have and the vein that, would get smaller. Vein would get smaller, and people get really short of breath because you can't get the blood back to your heart. Now what we do is we ablate areas around the veins on the outside, so that they're. It's the analogy I use is digging a trench around a fire. So if this turns into a, a, a line of scar, then these uh, rapid activations can can't, not, get past can't get past there and can't activate can't, the heart. Can't get past the trench. Yep. And then so the whole hope is that if we can contain those, that then this then your sinus node takes back so over. Show me, what, what does the sinus node do? It triggers a rhythm that goes where? So sinus node triggers a rhythm. So well, that's, that's the rhythm being triggered there. And it travels across the upper chambers, activates those when, when, the, when the heart muscle is activated electrically. The muscle then squeezes, and there's a little area in the middle here. I don't know if I should switch to a different color. Called the AV node in the middle of the heart. Where it's, I call that like a little uh, delay, a little kind of a relay switch, so to speak, I guess. And then there's some special uh, electrical fibers um, that extend down to the lower chambers. So heart rhythm starts up here, travels down here. There's a little delay, allows the blood to flow from the upper chambers to the lower chambers and then the heart muscles activated um, in the lower and chamber. It, and it triggers the atria to squeeze so yeah. that it dumps the last bit of blood that's flowing yep. into the ventricle. Into the lower chambers. And then when the lower chambers are activated, they pump blood out to the body this way. And then the right ventricle pumps blood out to the lungs that way. All right. So uh, let's look at uh, the... Ray, show me what the, where the ventricle is. I'm going to put this one on red now. Which is the ventricle and which is the atrium? Well, the AV line runs across here, and all those valves are in the same plane. And so you get a top and a bottom, and the right side is the patient's right, which is over here, and the patient's left, which is over here, if you're looking straight at. Right. So left ventricle is the muscular. So when we talk about function and pumping, we generally talk about the left because that's what pumps to the whole body. Right. Let's say my right side was completely not functioning. Would I still survive? Mm. You, that's another subspecialty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, but it can be really poor I functioning can, as long as the left ventricle is functioning. I can tell you, though, I mean, it, it, that's like race as a difficult question because um, it's been shown that people with bad right hearts, if you, especially if you have a bad left heart, once you get a bad right heart, that that correlates with really poor outcomes. So lots of hospitalizations, lots of poor survival. So well, let's say that the atria are not working. So th these are just kind of in atrial fib, so they're not emptying. They're just kind of quivering. Quivering. So flow still occurs. I mean, blood flows in. Yeah. It just doesn't get that last squeeze, right? Yeah, exactly. And then blood flows in from the lungs to the left ventricle and then out the, the aorta. Yep. Without these functioning, can you still live? Yes, for a long time. All right, and that's it. Ray, any other comments that you'd like to, to make about? It's like everything we do in, in hearts. It's kids may not even notice that they've got atrial fib. Those ventricles are so compliant. They're like an old balloon. They're, they fill naturally. And if you're elderly and you've had high blood pressure, they don't fill and they miss that atrial kick. So the atrial kick, it gives you about how much uh, improvement in an ejection fraction. Let's let's say a normal person empties their left ventricle 55 percent. That's a normal ejection fraction. Explain that. I don't think it'll change the ejection fraction, 
but the old teaching is if you have an impaired ventricle and you have congestive heart failure because it's the left ventricle is not squeezing, you get you can get up to a third of your cardiac output from the atrial kick. Depends a lot on how stiff someone's heart is. Like people that have really stiff, thick hearts tend to notice it a lot when they go into atrial fibrillation, whereas people that have really good compliant hearts, when your heart relaxes, that's an active process and it's like sort of like it just sucks blood into the lower chamber, so they may not notice quite as much if they lose that atrial kick. But the right. people with the stiff heart, they tend to really notice it. So we'll talk about diastolic heart failure, which is stiff heart, and systolic heart failure, which is uh, a lack of that ventricular squeeze in a minute. But let's, let's go to this. 18 years ago, Greg Schlintz had a serious heart attack. He was shocked four times before returning to a normal rhythm. Now, with a pacemaker, some lifestyle improvements, and help from the cardiac rehab group, he's changed for the better. There was a couple episodes in between uh, that, you know, 18 years ago and now, I think are pertinent because about eight years after the uh, original stint, uh, here again, I just started feeling sluggish and went back in. I was a little bit smarter at that time and they did angioplasty and opened up one of the arteries. And of course that worked very, very well. My heart wasn't beating in rhythm correctly. The top part of the heart was beating correctly, but the bottom heart on the other side was slower. And so it wasn't beating in time. So they offered a pacemaker to do that. So my efficiency of my heart had dropped down in the low 20s from being in the, the high 30s to 40s. So an average uh, efficiency of the heart is somewhere between 50 and 60 for a normal person. So it sounds worse than what it really is. But at that point, we opted for this. I didn't feel bad at that time, but I was able to have that. And I thought, let's do this while I'm feeling better and a little healthier. I walk a lot. And of course, I want to keep active. I live on the farm. And I'm a fantasy farmer. I have a few animals out there. So that keeps me busy doing that. Mainly, and if I can suggest anyone else that has this, is you know, get involved in the cardiac rehab program. Make yourself get up in the morning or whatever and get out and walk. 20 minutes a day doesn't, it's not much. So that really helps. I do watch what I eat. My weight has maintained you know, within a couple pounds of, uh, you know, my, not my ideal weight, but my same weight for 20 years. Well, just because we had a heart attack doesn't mean we're going to die. I mean, obviously I've been here for, going on you know, 19 years since my event, um, you, you have to decide that you want to continue on. And I guess that's what I did. And not that it's important to you, but the, uh, the next day after I had my heart attack, I signed the paper to go elk hunting in Colorado. And I've been elk hunting in Colorado every year since. So here again, just because you had a heart attack doesn't mean you're an invalid. Get out and do stuff. I, I think it's really important that you come up here because the other 20 people out here every morning putting their time and doing the same thing I am, we all have the same issues and we talk to each other and support each other and, and that is one of the most important things for me. Rather than the walking, it's the support group that I get here. And you get it from someone who has the same issues that you do. So, very important. Thank you for that, uh, Greg. Listen, if you've got questions, this is the time to ask. If you haven't asked your doctor about some things about your heart health, if you've got any thoughts about it, give us your call. Our number is 1-888-376-6225 or email your questions to ask at oncalltv.org. That was a great story. Uh, it was interesting to me how important the support group was to him. Has, have you noticed that, or have, uh, what's your what's been your take on those, Ray? I I think after the folks, I tell folks that the people I think do the best after heart attacks are those people who can incorporate exercise, lifestyle changes, and the people in particular who make that a part of their social structure. You know, they get friends there, they go have coffee, they exercise, it becomes um, a part of their, their life. Yeah. 
So it's interesting that when you and I were starting uh, practicing medicine, <clears throat> A lot of young men would have cardiac events and die. I mean, there were 35, 45 year old people that would be gone, you know, right out of their, you know, in the middle of their productive lives and their kids are, you know, lost their dads and the whole story. Uh, and, uh, and that happened a lot. It seems to be happening less, and the statistics support that. But our lifestyle is not as good as it used to be. Did, does that, I mean, I'm wondering if you think that that's uh, what's happened. I think it's a combination of people becoming aware there, there's things that we do when we save heart muscle, we directly um, reduce their, their complications downstream. And so I think they, number one, survive the event better, and number two, they have fewer morbidities down, down the road. That's right, yeah. And, and then, as, as much as you hate to say, you know, there's a pill that you can take for this, there, there's a pill you can take for this. Yeah. Right. Any comments about that? I'd say uh, a couple other things. Like for, I'd say from the rhythm perspective, one of the things is that people are are a little bit more aware of that. Um, we also have these things called AEDs. So um, that's um, automatic external defibrillator. And so when you go to the some public place, the mall, the airport, whatever, there will be a sign that says AED and like a lightning bolt. And uh, so if someone has a cardiac arrest, it used to be, I mean, it's very high risk of, very high instance of mortality, even with them. Death, um, mortality. Mortality um, out in the community, but they definitely save lives. And so now that people are aware of that, all they have to do is go, they're trained in CPR or, or just go get that and put the machine on. It will tell take, you. It'll tell you what to do. And it's, uh, it's kind of almost like a sort of Fisher Price instructions. It's like stand back, it's going to shock the patient. And it can it can save their lives. Makes a huge difference. Yeah, and that's how people often um, die from heart attacks. Is they 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 have these fatal arrhythmias that that if you don't make it to the hospital in time, that's how it can happen. Right, right. One of my uh, dear friends, and he's been on the show before. Tom Bozade tells the story. He wasn't feeling right. I mean, he, oh, I'm having something bad. I better get to the hospital. Got to the hospital, and he was there. Sudden event. Die. Uh, you know, his heart went into V-fib, ventricular fibrillation, and they shocked him, brought him back, shocked him, brought him back, shocked him, got him on the road to you guys, uh, he, uh, had an angioplasty, uh, uh, and uh, it was a small vessel, it wasn't a big vi vessel. And uh, they put in an AD, a, 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 put in a, a defibrillator, a, uh, what is that I, called? ICD. Yeah. ICD, <laughs> different than the AED. Yeah. Uh, put in an ICD, and he's got a defibrillator in case, but he's not had another event, and it's been a couple of years now. Yep. So it's a life. There, these things happen. I mean, I've got three friends that are alive because we they happen to be in the right place at the right time. And, and as John says, the, the external defibrillator is a huge difference. I, you know, that's... Um, that the time to your first defibrillation is directly related to how well you, whether A, you survive, and B, whether you survive neurologically intact. So you run to that AED device, it's at the church or at the mall or at the, at whatever it is, and you run over and you, if you don't know what you're doing, push the button, put it on their chest, and it'll, it'll automatically decide whether it needs it or not. Do it, that's the key. Get it, do it. We have a caller from uh, an 88-year-old. Do thyroid problems contribute to heart issues? Um, has restless legs, um, are they related to uh, heart problems? Uh, so, in my, and so in my field, thyroid problems absolutely relate to heart problems. But particularly, I check one on everyone that has atrial fibrillation, for instance, because if your thyroid's too, too active, let's say, can overstimulate the heart, um, end up in rapid heart rhythms of all sorts of kinds of things, and if you and your rhythm is going to be very difficult to control until you get the thyroid under control. Um, now, if your thyroid's underactive, you, people tend to gain weight, tend to be very fatigued. Uh, I don't see so much in, in terms of rhythm problems, but if you start gaining weight, you have all kinds of other problems. And then the restless legs could be some. We sometimes see that when people with sleep apnea, which certainly contribute to, to rhythm problems right. and all kinds of things. Right. I think hypo. I've seen numbers of hy uh, atrial fib related to uh, hypo. Yeah. I mean, I, I run into it. Well, I'll give you an example. Someone that I saw recently came in hypothyroid on thyroid replacement medication, referred to me about what to do about their rhythm. I checked their thyroid function and their hyperthyroid because they're overtreated for Taking their hypo. Taking too much. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's, you need to balance that thyroid yeah, just right. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah. Hypo meaning low, hyper meaning high. high. Yeah. Uh, we have a caller from uh, Sioux Falls, a 77-year-old. Discuss pacemakers. What kind of pacemaker is the best kind, and who decides that? <laughs> what, <that's> a, <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, uh, now I have lots of friends that work for all the different companies, okay? Um, and each company sort of has different things that, that they'll, they'll tell you is an advantage or a disadvantage, but by and large, they all will provide the backup slow heart rate support, you know. There's a there's a big issue going on now like about developing MRI compatible devices. Uh, what what MRI? MRI. So if you so if your doctor say your doctor wants to do an MRI of your brain to see if you had a stroke or they want to look at your knee cuz you're going to have knee surgery and they have to go in this really powerful magnet. Well, it's, it used to be thought that boy, I can't go in there if I've got a pacemaker. It turns out that there's some data coming out, not FDA approved yet, but a lot of the existing pacemakers that we have are actually Just fine. Them. Yeah, exactly. It might slow them down for uh, a minute or two, and yeah. then it goes. Yeah, um, but there have been there have been lots of um, lots of development of MRI compatible specific pacemakers. Right. Um, yeah, but and then their their algor the their algorithms, in other words, the way that the pacing. Uh, is, is performed is slightly different between the different companies, but I don't know that honestly, and from my personal experience, that that I would necessarily choose one over the other based on that. Good, and they're and they're probably all listening, and and you've got to have That's their right. friendship. You know, they That's come. Right. <laughs> so here's the so here's the patient patient who has atrial fib. So you put in a pacemaker, ventricular pacemaker, because it doesn't matter to have a rhythm in the atrium. Yeah. Uh, because they're going slow. They've got six sign of syndrome, which means that sometimes it goes too fast, sometimes it goes too slow. You put in a pacemaker, you keep them from going too slow, and you slow them down with some drugs so they don't go too fast. And they're doing great, yep. except that every time they want to run around, or if they want to go fast, or they want to walk around the wellness center to yep. stay active, the pacemaker's still going at 71 beats per minute or yep. whatever you yep. set it at. What, can, what are we doing now? Well, so pacemakers, and again, all the different companies have sensors built into their pacemaker, and some of them are activity sensors, and some of them relate to your breathing rate. So, uh, and then you can set that sensor to how much activity or how much breathing it takes to turn the sensor on, and then once you start doing activity, how much that sensor is activated as to what your heart rate really should be. And uh, so we can program all that into the pacemaker. And so if you're feeling tired uh, and you've got a single chamber pacemaker, it may be that the sensor's just not quite set right. Okay. Unless you're hyperventilating, some nervousness. <laughs> or, or you might not be getting enough sleep. Yeah. It may not get enough sleep. <laughs> That's it. So, um, is that how, what kind of an operation is a pacemaker? I mean, that's a big deal or what? Uh, not a big deal. We make about a three or four centimeter incision up in the, just up in the chest area, generally. An inch. Yeah, an inch or so. And then we actually, if you can, maybe I can use this here. Uh, what color am I on here? Green, maybe? So anyway, so this would be the pacemaker lead. We actually thread it through the vein that then comes down into the right, eight, the right upper chamber here, and we place the lead or it's a special wire in the right lower chamber and then sometimes we put a second one up here in the right upper chamber right and then there's a little pacemaker it's a little pacing generator about the size of a wristwatch that those leads plug into and then we just bury it underneath the skin in a little surgical pocket and they last for about how many years on average it's generally about eight or ten years but it'll tell you we test them once every two or three months until it starts tells you the battery's getting low. Yeah, everybody goes home with a little box and uh, they can send uh, information to us remotely over the internet, interestingly, and they'll tell you all about their battery and how their leads are functioning and all that kind of thing. And then if it turns out you don't go to the doctor, you don't have that box or whatever, yeah. it'll make a sound, it'll it'll sound an alarm when the pacemaker battery is getting to be too low and really? about three months out from when you need to It have makes a sound now. It'll start to make an alarm, really? yeah, or vibrate sometimes, yeah. So, Ray, you used to put pacemakers in before we had EP people. Have you done any of them? Are you doing any of them anymore? Uh, still doing them. There's <coughs> two of us Renaissance cardiologists who still... Still do pacemakers. Yeah. And but it's become a whole, you know, we'll put in dual chamber pacers, but as John now does, the more we learn, the more you figure out there's nuances to it. and so particularly if people have had a heart attack or their heart function isn't normal, they do better if you, if you pace. Okay, so, so we're so here, draw. We're one more time back here. But there's a, a structure where on the back side of the heart, the coronary sinus, and John can 
talk more about this because he knows more about it. But you can sneak a lead over and paste the left ventricle because it turns out that if your heart doesn't pump normally, that if you pump the, the right side of the heart, stimulate it, and the left, or what we call a biventricular device, that those people do better. And maybe 20% of people who get one of these need a lead afterwards and if they've had poor function. So one of the things that I do before I get a pace, or I put a pacemaker in, is check the heart function, and if it's down, then you might consider. they meet John. Oh, and have John do that <laughs> sinus thing and maybe it's paste an, it. It's left. another skill set. OK. So we've got a question from a 65-year-old. What, uh, what is this? Uh, what is sinus tachycardia? Uh, so sinus tachycardia can probably how do I erase this little right. thing? Right there. Right there. So I'm going to go green again here. So You like the green sinus, one. Yeah, I kind of like the green. Yeah. All it right. matches my tie, I guess. Yeah, that's so, right. <laughs> so the sinus node is right here. And again, like I said, that is the body's biolo rhythm. biologic pacemaker, yeah. so to speak. And sinus tachycardia is when this is beating more than 100 beats a minute. And so is that sinus a, meaning it's it's normal? Yeah. I mean, it's, it should be. I mean, if you're running, yeah. it should be running. My heart rate goes above 100. You know, when I run, if I run fast enough. If if you if you you're sitting sitting in in a room full of TV sets, cameras yeah. staring yeah. at you, sometimes it normal sinus tachycardia right? goes up. Yeah. But what is uh, so? What is paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, where you have atrial rhythm, and it comes on suddenly, paroxysmal? And it's tachycardia. Now that's not normal, like not sinus normal. tachycardia. Yeah. What's that? Atrial tachycardia means that you've got a tachycardia. So you mean means that you've got a focus where your heart's being activated from someplace other than the sinus node. This would be the sinus. That's the normal spot. Right. It's being activated from somewhere different, and that can be anywhere. Atrial tachycardia is actually one of the least common types of of sustained tachycardias, fast heart rhythms. Um, unless it, unless you've had ablation or surgery in the past, right. then 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 you set up circuit you set up areas where you can have these irrit irritated areas in your heart. Right. And you get so a lot of women, young women, will have paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, but it seems to go away, or it doesn't it give them any problems, or what? Actually, so the most common thing that that young women have, um, if you have a s sustained rhythm, is, is a a AV nodal tachycardia, AV node reentry, where you get this sort of I'm, I, I describe it as like a skipping record going around your AV node, which I said earlier is that little delay in the middle of your heart where the heart rhythm gets transmitted from the upper chamber to the lower chamber. And it just gets going really rapid around and around the AV So, I mean, it starts here and it gets here, and instead of going down and do that, it goes around and around and around and around, and it's really fast. It's reentry tachycardia. Pretty much, exactly. And you go in there and you put, and you, you do an ablation. What's that? Yeah, and I, and, I, and I burn this spot right there, and then it stops. And, the, the, and it really does work, doesn't it? And it works. About 95% long-term success wow. for that. That's yep. a wonderful thing. Yep. And that's that's <laughs> a that's a that's five days in the hospital and intensive <laughs> care and or. Well, so, so some of my partners will consider letting you go home the same day, depending on your situation. I keep everybody overnight, one night, let you go home the next day. Debatable whether that's really necessary, but I like to know if there's a complication, you know, early on. All right. You know. We've got a 70-year-old from Spearfish who talks about a persistent cough. Is it a sign of heart failure or heart trouble? Uh, Ray? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so ta let's talk about heart failure symptoms. Of a person, now there's two types of heart failure, right? Systolic and diastolic, and we're going to get into that in a minute. We're going to take a break before we do that. But if you have systolic heart failure, what symptoms would a person present with? Typically, you have shortness of breath, shortness of breath with exertion. So you're, you might be okay sitting around, but when you try to do something, you become short of breath. And orthopnea, or shortness of breath when you are sleeping, and, or when you're supine or laying flat related to the, the pressures in, in the heart and the lungs, or you may have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, or PND. Which, which, is, is, which is, which means every once in a while you get short of breath in the night. Yeah. And you wake up and have to catch your breath. Paroxysmal yeah. meaning out of the blue, nocturnal meaning. Off and on, nighttime. Nighttime, shortness of breath. Yeah, it's a big dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> we, we love to play these big words. Away. 
We're often blessed with the willingness of doctors from around the state who will go out of their way to help us out when we ask for their time. Last summer, we managed to catch Dr. Jerome Bentz in the parking lot of his clinic on his day off. He wanted to share a story about a success, the success of a patient. 60 plus year old farmer that comes to the uh, clinic every year for his physical exam and blood pressure beds and all that. And last year he came and his weight had gone up a little bit and we checked his blood and his blood sugar was up a little bit. And we had a, we had a talk about all that. And I said, you're getting to the point where you're, you might be having diabetes. His blood sugar wasn't in the diabetes range, but it wasn't in the normal range anymore either, so we, we call that pre-diabetes. And so we had a nice talk, and we got him lined up with a, a nutrition class that was going on at that time for pre-diabetes. I refilled his pills, sent him on his way, expected him to come back the next year like most everybody does, a little heavier, <laughs> blood sugar's a little higher, but he comes back this spring for his physical and here his weight is down 20 pounds and his blood sugar is normal and he's feeling better and you can tell he looks better and I'm always interested in those cases because somehow or another he changed his life around and adopted a healthier lifestyle. And I, and I always ask those people how they do it because it doesn't happen very often. And he said he basically took the classes cut out a lot of starches in his diet, started walking a couple of times a day, and that's how he did it. And I, I think that demonstrates how good preventative care can help prevent diseases in the long run from him. Otherwise, he'd be coming in later with diabetes, his blood pressure would be higher, his knees would start wearing out, and so we'd start finding all kinds of problems. Now he's probably prevented some of those, or at least put them off for a few years. I give that lecture to just about everybody I see for a physical and actually most people don't carry, carry through with it. Most come back the next year the same or worse, but every now and then people actually do do those things and accomplish their goals. That's kind of exciting to me. So Jerome said to me, but Rick, I'm, I'm just wearing my regular clothes on my days off. And I said, doesn't matter. So thank you, Jer uh, Jerome, for that. Uh, you know, the, the lifestyle issue he talked about, people, how, for, how effective are, you, are we in, in getting our patients to actually increase their exercise, work on their diet? Uh, how effective are we? Uh, I can tell you when, when we get them to do it, it's very effective for their health, but how effective are we at actually achieving that? I mean, it's like trying to get someone to stop smoking. It's very, very, very difficult, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I tell folks they, that they get our five-day emergency s tobacco cessation class when they come in with their heart attack, and you sometimes get people's attention when that happens, but um, I, yeah, I've got three or four patients that I can <laughs> remember over that were young in their 30s, stopped smoking. We fixed one artery and they've gone now 20, 25 years. And they've done just fine. But they, as Jerome said, they paid attention. They uh, actually did it. Yeah, they actually did the stuff. They knew it was a good thing. I found too that sometimes people will get the scare and they have bypass surgery or something like that. And they'll, they'll be all over it. They're eating healthy, they're exercising for about nine months and then they start to kind of fade back to the old ways. It's a, it really is, it's a, a lifestyle is really a change in your habits and to change a habit you got to keep doing it for, yeah. you know, consistently. I've got one guy that I use as an example for uh, all my patients when we're talking and he, he's done well. He had a bypass, he paid attention, he did all this stuff. And so one year, and he, he was, had a normal body mass index, and he was doing well, doing his rehab, stayed in rehab all the time. Comes back and he's 15 pounds lighter. Now, mind you, he was not overweight to start with. He had a BMI of 25, 26. So I asked him, what'd you do? He goes, well, you know, I, I heard that 10,000 step thing. So I, I started doing it, and it, I looked, he was kind of an obsessive guy. And, 
he checked a bunch of monitors and he goes, I found one that I want. I do my exercise in the morning for 20 minutes. I go do my whole day and then I watch the news at night and I look and see how many steps I'm short. And he said, I didn't change my diet, didn't change anything else. I just did my 10,000 steps. Yeah, I, I, I really think that it's the exercise that is the very most it just it outweighs all the rest of it and you know other things will follow with the exercise and of course we should do these other things but exercise is such an important thing what about a glass of wine a day what do you what's your your thinking on that i you know it's in vogue to, to have red wine and the antioxidants and there's some theory i'm not sure that it it hurts if you're alcoholic that's a problem um if it's too much, it's too much, and if it's not enough, but I, I think it's total calories and, and maintaining activity. Yeah, I don't know if a glass of wine a day really helps or hurts. Um, the, the substance that's in the red wine, the resveratrol, they're selling over the counter as a supplement, and you have to take get really high doses of that to show a difference. And I don't know that there's been any sur you know, hard endpoints, survival, that you're going to live longer if you drink a glass of wine a day. But one glass of wine a day is certainly not going to hurt. So the, a cardiologist, the head of the, uh, annal uh, of the uh, archives of internal medicine, now called JAMA of internal medicine, uh, gave a lecture at an ACP meeting and said, we know that cholesterol is an ele elevation is a risk factor for heart disease. But if you've not had a heart attack, uh, lowering of cholesterol uh, does very little to prevent the onset of other things and, and doesn't hold a candle to lifestyle changes, particularly exercise. Um, certainly, if you've had a heart attack, it's a good thing. But there's controversy about that if you've not had a heart attack. What's your take on that? There's, well, there's, you and I have gone back and forth about yeah. this for years. <laughs> so, but I, there's, there's no free lunch. And everything we do comes with um, a side effect, whether it's simply expense, um, and, and it goes to the heart of, is it primary prevention? Do you treat everybody with everything? Or secondary prevention, you've had some a problem, and now we're trying to secondarily prevent things. And I, it becomes the milieu in, in, in which it's, it's used. Um, statins where there's a big controversy about what do you use how much do you use and all that at this point but i think there's very good data that statins reduce your incidence of second heart attacks first heart attacks there's data if you have you know some lab values abnormal and things and how much how low uh, is, is debatable but yeah i have to say so i think i i I think, now I have a friend who's a chiropractor, for instance, and advocates the diet and exercise, and there's no substitute for, for a healthy lifestyle, so I agree with that. So if you're living a really terribly unhealthy lifestyle and you can lose a bunch of weight and get your cholesterol under control in that type of situation and you're still young, then that's I, I kind of wonder what is the benefit of statin. I don't think that's really been demonstrated. Um, they changed the guidelines recently on cholesterol, and I found it all very confusing. I just read an article just... Uh, yesterday about you know how accurate are all the different risk prediction scores and so I find all the the new uh, cholesterol guidelines actually quite confusing but what Ray says is absolutely true I mean if you've had a heart attack or you've got heart disease you've demonstrated you know uh, uh, plaque in your carotid arteries I mean you should you should take a statin yeah. right I and, and I think that one of the things that makes me very skeptical and I, I'm you know as I get older I get more skeptical is that, that the American Heart Association, which I have always been very supportive of until uh, you know, a period of time where I felt like they were getting in undue influence by pharma, uh, I know that 80% of their, their, you know, their, their uh, would pay, would supporting them is, is pharma, pharma, uh, pharma industry. So you know, I worry that the people who are making the guidelines of to doing this or that are unduly influenced by uh, industry now thank goodness for industry we have drugs that make wonderful differences I'm not saying I'm against that and I'm not saying I'm against uh, 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 statins in the right place but I, I'm, I'm disappointed in the American Heart Association and we need better guidelines in this like you said it was confusing I, I think we're confused and I think you get if you're whole, confused you get, you get a whole bunch of different opinions 
Yeah. And, and I think that's what's confusing for folks out yeah. there is that we're not together on it, are we? No. And, and I think it's honest. It's, it's the scientific method and scientific debate and... Um, Let it roar on. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. So d what about cholesterol in our diet? You know, eggs has had a bad name for a long time. Is it bad for you? Seems like it just doesn't matter. <laughs> That's what I think too. That's a good answer. Now let's get back to our questions. We've got great questions. Thank you very much. 84-year-old uh, from um, Sioux City, Iowa, uh, has serious shortness of breath. How serious is shortness of breath in a potential history of a heart murmur? This is a big one, Ray. Well, you have to be suspicious. Yeah. And and I think that's, you know, we walk sometimes a fine line between ordering a whole bunch of unnecessary tests and being appropriately suspicious and investigative. And if you never look under a rock, you don't know what's there. So. I do the echo too. <laughs> Get the echo done. Yeah. Yeah. Echo the heart. That's a good test. It yeah. does tell you a lot. That tells you a lot. Yeah. Uh, Viberg. Uh, how familiar are they with the procedure for uh, f freeing or freezing for atrial fib? How successful is it? Well, we, you talked about it, talked but about there's it. also this other procedure when they're in the in the heart. Yeah. Uh, what so, is, I'll what go is back it? to the drawing board here, I guess. I don't know what color we're on here. But, okay. but basically, I, I said that you can burn around the, the pulmonary vein to isolate it. Right. Or the other thing that you can do is you can have a balloon that basically you put into the pulmonary vein and you inflate it and then it freezes around the rim of the pulmonary vein. And so it's another way of doing the same thing. And it's been shown in studies that if you can get the vein isolated, then the outcomes are the same. Okay. Okay. Now, um, there's debate about sometimes it's easier to get the veins, if, if you're really good with a catheter, um, it's very versatile. If you're very good with a balloon, some people are very good and have very good results with the, pulmon with the balloon. Otherwise, it's, it's, this, it's a different way of doing the same thing. Okay. And wh wh what about the procedure where they scrape uh, what, uh, for atrial fib, where they do, uh, what is it called? They, they do, isn't it some kind of... Uh, oh, maze? Maze procedure. What's that? that? That is typically a surgical procedure, and uh, one of our partners actually does a lot of that. Um, but really... Well, it's over on that side. Well, they, so they would do like a line over here. They would... Uh, do basically the same kind of thing here. They would do some across the back of the atrium and then one down to the mitral. And it works yeah. pretty good? It works pretty well, yeah, as long as it's done well. Again, it all depends on how well the procedure is done. If you do it quick and don't really make good, good, good what we call lesions or damage yeah. the heart muscle quite the, well, yeah. then it doesn't work very well. Yeah, exactly. Here's a caller, uh, one of your old teachers, uh, one of your young teachers, Betty Gerberding Ray, she sends her hello. I thought that's wonderful. I love Betty Gerber. <laughs> 81 year old from White said, had a blackout three weeks ago. She has a pacemaker and congestive heart failure. Could her blackout have anything to do with her heart condition? She's concerned about driving. So she's 81. She has a pacemaker and heart failure, and she blacked out. What do you think? Uh, so blacking out, or what we call syncope, is a very broad. Uh, a lot of things could cause that. Could be blood pressure too low, could be prob that's it. Yeah, probably not heart rate too fast, or sorry, not too slow. Could be heart rate too fast. Um, we'd have to check. It could be related to our medication, all that kind of stuff. Right. But if you do black out and you're concerned about driving, you shouldn't drive. Right. I, I think that's, that's if you, I, I generally think until we figured out why the blackout occurred, Let's not drive Don't for drive. a while. Yeah, I mean, you can hurt not just yourself, but some young Somebody family else. or, yeah, yeah. exactly. I think, in addition to add, add there? I, being safe is always a good idea. All right. And any words to Betty Gerberding? She'd be proud to, to know that I enjoyed Shakespeare, and I took a, a senior-level Shakespeare class in, in college that oh. I <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed, and I got, I got that from her. I love that. <laughs> Okay, here is a 58-year-old from Yankton. Please discuss side effects of medicines, um, uh, metoprolol and nitro patches. That's your baby, I think. From Shakespeare to metoprolol <laughs> and uh, uh, side effects of, of uh, nitroglycerin patches. Well, too slow. It's the old too slow on the heart rate and too low on the blood pressure. And 
some is good and too much is not. And it depends on why you're taking it to start with. And a lot of times we're treating blood pressure with beta blockers and as a side effect, the heart rate goes too slow. Yeah, I think the, the new trend to go ACE inhibitor first, and actually ACE inhibitor better than the ARBs for heart failure, and the new trend to even use a little amlodipine as second drug rather than diuretics for blood pressure is a good thing. The problem is that uh, metoprolol is really needed with heart people with coronary disease. <coughs> And nitroglycerin patches, I, I've turned to nitroglycerin sublingual, not patches. What do you think of that? Headaches. I get headaches from nitro. Yeah, I think there's headaches, and, I, and it goes counter to, to what we were originally taught as internists, that yeah. you use one drug and you max it out, and, then, and I think now the tendency is to use a little of this and a little of that and maximize the benefit and minimize the side effect. Right. A couple of little drugs, lower doses than higher doses. Of but it's complicated for folks to yeah. do that. And every individual is different. Eureka, caller has systolic pressure of 160 to 190 range, swollen legs. Is it a heart issue? The swollen legs uh, likely could be. Um, I would, if their blood pressure has been that high for a long period of time, probably a thick, stiff heart um, could have trouble moving fluid through their system and can end up with some swelling that way. Some people say we're not using enough spironolactone uh, as a blood pressure agent, in, particularly when there's edema and, uh, and, and their aldosterone levels. I mean, this is a drug that, that works on potassium sparing and so on and so forth. What's your take on that, Ray? Well, I think if you have heart failure, you need there's some definite survival benefits to doing that. Um, the swollen legs are... Uh, a potpourri of problems. I mean, it could be a calcium blocker, a medication side effect. It veins. could be veins. Uh, veins. Liver, yeah. liver. I mean, it, it's it's a potpourri. Is right. How about uh, does peripheral neuropathy have anything to do with heart? And what is the me uh, medication for peripheral neuropathy? It can. The. the we like to think that everything's connected to arteries and blood yeah. vessels. And so if you have small vessel disease that affects, as a side effect, the nerves can be affected. But And diabetes could cause a lot of heart disease, and it's the most common cause of neuropathy. Yeah. So, and uh, best medication for peripheral neuropathy, some say amitriptyline. So, uh, uh, not, nothing works very well. That's the atomized special. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, sometimes people use like Lyrica, some people use um, yeah. gabapentin. Gabapentin. Yeah. Talk about myocardial infarction. What is the definition of a myocardial infarction? That's Ray. Ray. That's a heart attack, and that's death of a muscle, infarction's medical dictionary for death. death. And myocardium is heart and, and or muscle and uh, heart muscle, and so you'd have death of heart muscle related to an interruption of blood supply. So, and that generally, uh, the interruption is a coronary artery. Yeah, a atherosclerosis would be the, the classic. A what? Atherosclerosis, right. or hardening of the arteries, cholesterol deposited in the artery wall. And, and real quick, like, uh, are most heart attacks because of a clot that forms where the atherosclerosis is, or does it just slow build up of the atherosclerosis? It's typically a, Ten a plaque rupture. Okay. A small, a, the artery tears and a blood clot forms at the point. Wow. Okay. We'll be back, back right after this. All around town, from stores to playgrounds, babies are on the move. And there are diseases that are on the move too. And some of these spread easily. To best protect him from 14 serious diseases by the time he turns two years old, vaccinate him according to the recommended schedule so he can go on about his business and you can have peace of mind. For more reasons to vaccinate, talk to your child's doctor or go to cdc.gov forward slash vaccines. Every once in a while, my heart seems to be jumping out of my chest and I get a weak feeling and short of breath, the patient explained. When I listened with my stethoscope, his rhythm was different than the usual lub-dub foot-tapping sounds, which are regular as a band marching through town on a summertime parade. Instead, his heart had the irregular rhythm of popping corn, chaotic and unpredictable, and I couldn't 
tap my foot to it. As predicted, the EKG showed the rhythm of atrial fibrillation with the atrial rate running three to 400 beats a minute and the ventricular rhythm chaotic, as experts say, irregularly irregular at about 150 beats per minute. Atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is the most common abnormal heart rhythm condition. It afflicts about 1% of the total population, more than 2 million people in the U.S., and 8% of all those older than 80 years of age. There are many causes for atrial fib, including long-standing high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, sleep apnea, too tight or too loose heart valves, too much or too little thyroid hormone, blood clots to the lung, and an inherited conduction system or wiring condition, excessive amounts of tobacco, coffee, alcohol, or amphetamine, a viral infection involving the heart, stress of any kind, or just an old, weak heart. There are two main reasons we need to do something about this rhythm abnormality. Most devastating can be the clots that can form in the atria since they're not emptying effectively, resulting in something like 10 to 25% of all the strokes that occur to the brain. Second, the ventricles are not efficient pumps when the atria are fibrillating, and even worse when they're running at about 150 beats per minute. So with atrial fib, we have to slow the heart rate down, thin the blood to prevent strokes, and sometimes even bring the rhythm back to normal when we can. While we're at it, physicians need to study why atrial fib happened in this particular case. It's a complex and interesting condition, and there are a lot of debate about what kind of blood thinners to prescribe, what kind of rhythm controlled drugs to use, and when to use fancy surgery and pacemaker treatments. But the bottom line about atrial fib is that good treatment by your general or cardiology physician can prevent problems and allow a normal life, even with the heart rhythm as irregular as popping corn. Well, this brings us to the end of our show this evening. For more of this discussion and answers to the questions we didn't get to, and we, got, we have a bunch of questions that we want you to hear uh, during the show, join us for After Hours by going to the website oncalltv.org. I really thank our wonderful guests, Ray Allen and Jonathan Adams from North Central Heart in, in Sioux Falls. Thank you so much. And a heart show this close to Valentine's Day needs to say something about love. Beat Generation author Ken Kesey wrote, People think love is an emotion. Love is good sense. And from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Why do I have it? What can I do to control it? What can I eat? What lifestyle changes do I need to make? Diabetes brings us many questions when we are diagnosed. We will work to answer those questions and more next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Welcome to On Call After Hours, where we try to, between popcorn, answer the questions we weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of our show. All of your questions are important to us, and we want to answer as many as we can for you. So let's dive into it. 86-year-old atrial fib, after 80-year-old uh, doctor wouldn't uh, shock, uh, didn't want to shock her or him, after 80. Is this standard procedure? Uh, there's no real standard for who gets cardio, what's called a cardio version to mm -hmm. shock your heart back to normal. Uh, I, I kind of base it on a lot of things really, looking at your echocardiogram and things, but like do you have symptoms or not related to the atrial fibrillation? If it's uncertain, I'll do a cardio version just to kind of see how you feel. Because really getting back into normal rhythm is all about symptoms, it's not about living longer. And 
there's a price to pay if you, you get them back into rhythm. You got to go on these drugs that drag you down. Sometimes, yeah. <clears throat> At 80, it's generally not appropriate <clears throat> to do that defibrillator to bring you back to a normal rhythm. And, and that's not to say you wouldn't do CPR, right? Yeah. We're talk not talking CPR. We're yeah. talking about bring it to a normal rhythm. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, you know, like I don't have a hard and fast rule. There's no standard, like I said, but. But uh, the longer you've been in atrial fibrillation, the harder it's going to be to keep you in normal rhythm. And uh, sometimes we do it just to see if you're really having symptoms or not related to the okay. atrial fibrillation. Yeah. This is yours, Ray. My sister has a heart murmur and she takes antibiotics before getting down to work. Are we still doing that? Almost, almost not at all. We've sort of gone 180. If you've got a, if you've had a heart in valve infection previously, then yes. If you've got a mechanical valve. If you've got a mechanical valve, then yes. And that's actually, actually, and, and, actually, it's prosthetic valve. valve. Yeah, so it's, whether it's tissue or mechanical. Oh, yeah. So or if you've got an official valve, that's it. Yep. If you've got, if you've got a prosthetic, and, and if you've had a valve replacement procedure, you get it. If you've got congenital heart disease, you get it. Or if you've had a valve infection before, you but get it. But not with a murmur anymore. No. Nope. We're done. That's changed. And that's within the last five years. Correct. 60-year-old caller wants to know the effects of Viagra on the heart. Ray, that's yours. It was uh, it was designed as a heart drug and and sort of as a side effect. It's, it's labeled dose now, but um, I don't think there there's actually too much effect on the heart. There's more of a concern that people will get into trouble. The the big problem is nitrates, and what it does is it it reduces the metabolism of nitrates. So if you have chest pain, take a nitroglycerin, you may get a very profound drop in your blood pressure, so it's dangerous. Some people use um, Viagra, they name it differently, but for high blood pressure in the lungs to help the right heart function. So in some ways it can be good for the heart. Right. So, But most so people don't take Viagra for that reason. Some people use uh, Encialis and Aleg uh, 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 Levitra. Uh, all of those uh, have a dilation effect to the coronary arteries. Uh, and that was the original th yeah. the reason they were developing them. But yep. now we're using it for pulmonary hypertension yep. and we're using it for people with prostate problems. So there's, you know, the last, you know, yeah. it's, it's raising a lot of more questions besides just other things that it's raising. 22 year old, what is a sign of tachycardia? Uh, the most common one is palpitations. People just talk about and palpitations is just I feel my heart pounding in my chest, my heart racing. You might feel lightheaded. So That's, tachycardia yep. is fast heart rate. Yep, fast heart rate. Can be from a lot of different kinds, yep. including atrial fib. And that's the next question. What causes atrial fib? And I, I answer that really on, yeah. the, on the essay. Well, that's, I mean, really, it depends on how deep you want to get into it. But that'd be, you know, the million dollar question for us as electrophysiologists. What's the most common? Well, so the conditions that are associated with it, the risk factors are, big one is age. The, uh, the correlation with age is almost, almost goes up exponentially as you start to hit your mid-60s and go on to your 70s. 6% of people over 65 have atrial fibrillation. But then uncontrolled high blood pressure, stiff heart, history of a heart attack, heart failure, um, thyroid problems can cause it, uh, other drugs can cause it. Um, alcohol, believe it or not, a lot of people, I've, I've seen, you know, see it all the time, people come in around the holidays, Super Bowl, they come in and uh, they drink a lot of alcohol and they have more atrial fibrillation. So a lot of different Stimulants, causes. yeah. You, that's part of our job, figure out why they did this. 78-year-old from Jefferson wants to know if there are generic blood thinners, alternatives for the very expensive drugs. Coumadin is the only generic blood thinner out and there. It's and it's, it's much cheaper than all the rest. It's very cheap, but you have to have your blood tested all the time. And it interacts with a lot of other uh, I'd have to look in a PDR, but actually Coumadin is a brand name, it's not but warfarin. Warfarin. Uh, warfarin. There's a generic warfarin. version of right. Coumadin. Warfarin. Yeah, right. warfarin, warfarin is the generic, generic All the other ones are brand name only. Right. And statistically, looking at all the data, it's, there, it's about as safe and it's about as effective as the others. Disagree or agree? Uh, disagree. So the difference is Pradaxa uh, or Dabigatran and Eliquis Apixaban are both shown to be superior to Coumadin for reducing your risk of stroke. Pradaxa has more GI bleeding uh, relative to Coumadin, um, and Eliquis has less GI bleeding and less intracranial bleeding than Coumadin. Now, the difference in how superior they are is not much. Less than and, a percentage. And the reason for that is because if you take your medicine and you're taking Pradaxa or you're taking Eliquis, uh, Apixaban, 
your blood is thin consistently. Whereas Coumadin, there's this thing called time and therapeutic range, or how often is your blood really thin enough from your Coumadin, and it's usually about 65 to 70% of the time in any trial that you do. It's because it's hard to manage. It goes up and down, the INR yeah. does. Yeah. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm a warfarin man at this point, not to say that I'd always be. Well, so the disadvantage of the new ones is there's no antidote for any of them. There you go. So that's a big And problem. you can't monitor whether they're taking it. Can't monitor. It's yeah. the most dangerous drugs that they're the most dangerous drugs that we prescribe and I can't prove that they're taking it except I can with warfarin. Yeah. Heart valves, Coumadin only at this point. They yeah. did a trial with trying to see if Pradaxa would and it actually was worse. That's important information. Yeah. Comments? I agree. Uh, <laughs> 92 year old caller from Rapid has a pacemaker placed two years ago, has hot flashes from elbow to elbow across his chest. Related to the pacemaker? Uh, that would be really an unusual presentation. I don't, I've never seen that myself. Something in their spine. It's a back problem. It sure sounds like it depends on how they wife. define flashes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, it, uh, could it, it could be coronary disease, I suppose. He's 92. You never know what 92-year-old. My guess is it's cervical spine uh, impingement. Does walking count as helpful exercise toward the 20 minutes suggested per day? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. 57-year-old from St. Paul, what would cause a tightness pain in my chest after a brisk walk and a large meal? Ray. That'd be coronary disease until proven otherwise. Yeah. So what's the next step? Um, well, depending on the situations and how much exercise, you could do a variety of things, if, but an exercise test. You know, the only, there's some argument, though, because if you've got classic angina, the exercise test isn't going to change what you're going to do. It, the exercise test is to decide whether you're going to go, I'm going to send him to Ray Allen to do an angiogram. It, 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 it goes to the heart of over-testing and o what's an appropriate test in a setting. And sometimes the, we've gone swung too far because in the old days, we would say new angina, sounds like angina, let's do an angiogram. And now a lot of times insurance companies would demand that we do another test, whereas in the old days, we would have saved them a test. Yeah, it, it depends. And it depends upon that case. That guy needs to see the doctor, talk to her or him about the symptoms. And there's other an ancillary questions you'd ask. Yeah. How long does it last? Short of breath, sweaty, all yeah. those sorts of things. Right. Uh, I have been diagnosed with atrial flutter, not fib. Yep. What's the difference? So atrial flutter, I'll go, I don't know if we can still use this thing. Uh, but atrial flutter is a more yeah. organized rhythm, more confined to the right atrium, where you kind of have this re-entrance circuit in the right atrium. And when we ablate that, we burn an area from your, from this IVC, inferior vena cava, to the valve, and then that stops it. It stops it. Yeah. Okay. So Kind of on the same spectrum, there's still a risk of stroke. Uh, we treat it like atrial fibrillation in terms of risk of stroke, and about 30, 40 percent of people with atrial flutter end up with atrial fibrillation later on. Yeah. Cool. yeah. yeah that's interesting. But, that, but this one's not... Um, it's much more organized. It's, and it's more on the right than it's on the left. That's interesting. There's all kinds of anatomy that John knows that nobody paid attention to <laughs> before. Back in the old days. Internal, internal anatomy and landmarks. Until you're trying to ablate it or not ablate that. <laughs> That's why you had two extra years of, of fellowship. Could yeah. you talk about the issue of ventricular hole that's been diagnosed in a five and a half year old girl, telling her parents that this could close on its own, they hear a heart murmur, feel that she could have golden har syndrome. Does that relate to the heart issue? Congenital birth defect involving deformity of the face. So there's a there's a facial deformity, and there's this heart murmur. It sounds like a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. Does it ever close on its own? Do VSDs close? The, the pedi pediatric cardiologist would talk about whether that's a restrictive VSD or an unrestrictive. And basically, restrictive would mean that it's small enough that there's a pressure gradient across it. And typically, if there's a large pressure gradient, those will often, at small, those will often close but that's, again, a whole subspecialty unto itself. And if the pediatrician, pediatric cardiologist said it will leave it alone, it, then it's probably leave it alone. They probably know what they're talking about. What about a holes in the atrium? Uh, via ASD, atrial septal defect, or patent foramen ovale. You know, for a while there, we were plugging those all, 
we're not doing that anymore, are we? Some of them. Yeah, I think it's an unknown. Yeah, Peyton Foramen Valley is is when a little flap from your right upper chamber. All right, so let's do that. So Peyton, you can't really see it here, but just imagine that there's a line here dividing the two upper chambers, and there's this little flap here um, that you get um, when you're born. It closes and then seals off the the connection between the two upper chambers. But in about 25% of people, that does not close, and so blood can flow between the left upper and left and right upper chambers of the heart. And so it's thought that that may have um, it may have some implications with stroke, and it's been thought that maybe some people with migraines, if you close that, that that helps. And so it's been really difficult to know who exactly to close that for. Like Ray was saying, it's been kind of controversial. No real good trial data to to really say one way or the other. I don't. I don't, I'm not, that's not my, my area of expertise. But it's, go ahead. Yeah, and an ASD is not a patent free valley. That's just an actual hole in the actual atrium, atrial septum, so there would be like a hole up here between, so between the two. And those often don't close on their own. Right, and you make that diagnosis how, Ray? Listening, EKG, and the gold standards and echo, you look. You look you at image it. Do a little bubble study. Yeah. And if, if uh, the right heart is getting enlarged or having strong some dysfunction, that's usually when you decide to close that. And in the old days, um, when the only way to close it was an open chest surgical procedure, then there was a little stricter criteria as you weigh the risk versus, versus the benefits. Now, you know, some of our partners can go in with uh, a catheter and deliver a patch across that and seal close it, it off. off. Yeah. It's amazing. 85-year-old, what could be causing heart to fibrillate at random? That could be atrial fibrillation. So as we've talked about before, um, unless they're talking about sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. I think that's it, the ant random. So, so, why is it happening so it comes and goes. Yeah. So it comes and goes. Sporadically. Yeah. Nobody really knows why it comes and goes in some people and not in others, but uh, it can be the fluctuations in blood pressure, um, alcohol could be due to can just be, we, we may not have the answers to why it comes and goes. From my perspective, that's actually a good thing because it's easier to control when it comes and goes than right. when it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. we like that. Uh, clip, is it recommended to have a clip surgery to stop the backflow of blood in the heart? I don't know what a clip. E clip, I think. Oh. Yeah, it's again, we're venturing into structural cardiology and. Okay, so show so, us where, where the clip so, would be. So the mitral valve, is this valve that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle, and the mitral valve is here. And typically what happens is one of these leaflets, and classically the posterior leaflet, prolapses, either because this heart muscle's been damaged here in the support structure, which looks like a parachute, becomes interrupted, and so one of these leaflets will prolapse back into the ventricle and, and not meet. And so one of the uh, surgical remedies in the old days is called a Fiori stitch, where they would open the heart and place a stitch and sew that in between. So the, the leaflets co like that. You put a stitch in the middle and then blood flows around either side. The side effect is you can get narrowing of that artery doing that. Well, now, if you come retro through the aorta backwards with a catheter, come up here, and while the heart's beating, you clip that and do this with a catheter and basically staple it together, then um, you can accomplish the same thing without an open heart. Wow. And it works? It does. Um, we've not en embarked on that adventure, but it's, it's complicated. One of the big reasons to do it is if you have poor heart function, this artery dilates in these vessels. They just can't coapt and they stretch and dilate. So it's done on people who are really sick, have a lot of problems. They're not a surgical candidate. There you have it. It's technically challenging. Right. Here is Facebook question. I've been diagnosed with acute coronary syndrome. It's a serious condition or not? And would diet help? What's acute coronary? Is that just recurrent chest pain, angina? That's the new plaque rupture. You got cholesterol in the artery wall. It ruptures. You got a new tear in the lining of the artery. 
you get a blood clot that blood clots waxing and waning, the flaps waxing and waning. Some of the time it resolves, some of the time it seals off. Most people will give you a history of that accelerating pain in retrospect Okay. after right. a heart attack. Tough one. Uh, pulmonary hypertension and its relationship with the heart. Pulmonary hypertension. Uh, either of us is supposed to try that. Pulmonary hypertension means that and I'm not a pulmonary hypertension expert. That's usually the people that are heart failure experts look at that. You treat it with Viagra. Yeah, treat it with Viagra. Let's sum it up that way. But basically what it means is this is the pulmonary artery blood coming out of the right ventricle going to the lungs. The lungs are attached, okay? And what that means is that for some reason there's high blood pressure in the, blood ves in the vascular bed inside the lungs. And uh, we can get a sense of how high that blood pressure is by looking at an echocardiogram. We can sort of get a sense of how high it is. Um, and then it can be due, for, due to a lot of reasons. A lot of times it's because you've got a bad left heart and there's high pressure in this left atrium where I've said that the blood drains back to the heart through these pulmonary veins. And uh, this gets reflected and causes high blood pressure. Other common causes are sleep apnea, uh, smoking, can, uh, emphysema, um, and, chronic bronchitis. And that big bad illness called idiopathic. Idiopathic means the arteries themselves are actually clamped down and causing hypertension. That's a very rare, very serious disease. But the interesting thing is that you tell it by the echo, yep. looking at the right ventricle, the tricuspid regurge leak. Yeah. And, and if you're really concerned, Ray will stick a catheter up here and measure the pressure directly. Yep. Yep. Right. 96-year-old uh, with atrial fib for three years, takes uh, tenolol for her but her atrial fib comes back with any exertion. Is there anything she can do to manage the atrial fib? There are other drugs for atrial fib. Other than atenolol. In fact, often I don't tend to use atenolol in people that are 96 because atenolol is cleared by the kidneys, so I tend to use metoprolol because it's cleared by the liver. When you're 96, your kidney function tends to decline almost no matter what you do. Um, it could be that your heart rate is well controlled when you're sitting around having coffee and things, but when you get up and try to do activity, then your heart rate jumps way up and then right. you notice it. So you either need more medicine for rate control, which means that your heart rate might get to be too slow when you're not doing activity, or we could use alternative medications for that. I like cardiozem rather than the beta blockers. What do yeah. you think? Well, so I, so <laughs> that's, I think you can kind of use either or. If people have a weak left heart, heart function's weak, I don't use cardiozem. I use beta blockers because they need it anyway for the weak heart. Uh, young pe patients tend to really not tolerate beta blockers like atenolol or metoprolol. They get very fatigued, switch them to cardiozem, they feel much better. Um, uh, elderly patients, it's kind of a hit and miss either way, whichever one works. Are you ever using DIG anymore? Uh, in people that have poor blood pressure, I'll use DIG, or if I'm already using the other things, then I'll no, into shocks. But it drags those 90-year-old people down. 68-year-old from Brookings who doesn't have any heart problems, does uh, one and a half hours of exercise every five days a week, is a vigorous exercise in a 68-year-old. Dangerous or is it helpful? Ray? I'd say it's probably helpful. It's um, burst work is, you know, what's, <clears throat> what really gets people is when you um, um, watch TV and eat pizza for nine months of the year and then you think you're gonna go hike for seven miles chasing a pheasant. Yep. And you're just, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that, you gotta be right, you, get, you need to be in shape so you can hunt those pheasants. Facebook, 68 year old diagnosed with Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, had ablation 20 years ago, hasn't had symptoms for 15 years. Still need to be concerned about WPW? Well, if they, if, so WPW yeah, is. Yeah, what is it? So, what is, are we green or are we red here? So We're here's green. your sinus node, and this is your body's biologic pacemaker. It fires off, starts your heartbeat. It's supposed to come only through this AV node to be able to conduct electrical signal down to your lower chambers. Some people will have a little sleeve of muscle tissue but on the, one of these valves where some electricity can swing through here and, and directly activate the lower chamber. And what that physician did is they came up, let me see if I can, and they ablated that muscle tissue right there and got rid of it. So you can see that on the electrocardiogram that that is gone. And if it's gone, then they're, then they're cured. All right, so this person is cured? 
provided they don't have any more conduction through that that pathway right. there. Well, it's been 20, 15 years. As long as their EKG is normal, then yep, should be should be cured. 54 year old woman with a heart attack last year had angioplasty and stents placed. Had lifestyle changes with exercise and diet. What can I do to reduce the risk of heart failure down the road? What is the anterior wall of the? Where is the anterior wall of the heart located? Right. Anterior is the, the dictionary thing again. The anterior is the front, front of the heart. Oh. Here. So typically, did we have a coronary diagram? So yeah. it's, it oh. involves the typically the, the septum and the front wall, and it would be the wall that you see in front. And this is our four chambers basically looking here, but um, supplied by this wall this artery, the anterior descending, which means the artery down the front of the heart, and it typically supplies the septum as well. So the things to do would be, if there's gonna be a problem with that stent, it typically occurs within around the first year. And as that heals and seats in there, then, um, then it becomes secondary prevention. So you want your LDL cholesterol under 70, you want to get to your body weight, you want to control your diabetes, you want to stop smoking, and you want to exercise. Okay. Explain different symptoms of heart attack in men and women. That They're different. They're different birds. <clears throat> I think they're different because they present in different, different times in their life, and women tend to have a delayed presentation from 20 years after menopause, whereas men start 20 years after 20. And Typically, women are smaller, and so they'll often present with more severe diffuse disease, and so they get more shortness of breath. But I think if you listen to a lot of people, they will all come in with their share of somewhat atypical pain, you know, dental pain that come. But it's all it's related to exertion, those sorts of things. Um, so they don't cla the classic. Uh, I've got an elephant standing on my chest; it goes into my neck, down my arm. That occurs about thirty percent of the time. If I have a good number for that. Yeah, men will have an elephant sitting on their chest and women will have a brassiere that's too tight. That's interesting. That's a yeah, and, when you say and there it is, that's the difference. If you ask them about chest pain, a lot of patients will say, well, I haven't any pain, just heaviness or tightness yeah, or tightness. something like that. 65-year-old yeah. from Moorbridge comment, right on spot with atrial fib, loves the show. <laughs> Yay! Grandson, 21, faints, good health, feels, uh, uh, feels off before shower, feels faint in shower, but mm -hmm. loses balance when he gets out to try and relieve this fainting. Does this have something to do with the heart? So the, he faints in the hot shower. Oftentimes that's what we call a vagal episode. So people, when, it, when you start to feel warm or you get in a warm situation or if you've got nausea or something like that, it's really just um, uh, kind of a profound um, reflex is what I tell people. And your body has two reflexes, if you want to simplify it, either the adrenaline rush, where you know, you're know you out running from a, like people always say running from a tiger, or there's the anti-adrenaline rush, like when you're going to bed at night and you're tired and everything slows down. And so oftentimes when passing out happens in the bathroom, it's that anti-adrenaline rush, and your heart rate and your blood pressure both drop at the same time, and people can pass out. And this guy, I think, has been on seizure medication, so it, it probably made the pressures lower. With if your blood, so you can have a seizure if you pass out and your blood pressure is low and you don't get enough blood flow to your brain, right. you can have a seizure. But the seizure but medicines will set you up for blood pressure dropping easily. True, very true. Make it so worse. It's that, that seizure versus cardiac is a very difficult thing to sort out sometimes. What is a sick sinus syndrome? Sick sinus syndrome is when your sinus node is not firing off fast enough or not regular enough. So if it just kind of stops or if it just is firing off very slow and you start to feel that, you're tired, you're short of breath, you're weak, you get on it and we can put people on a treadmill and their heart rate doesn't go up, that's sick sinus syndrome. And the last question, 75-year-old uh, with pacemaker taking prescribed heart medicine and losing weight. does. The combination of pacemaker and medications cause weight loss. You'd ask about digoxin, because sometimes when that dose is high, they'll have a anorexia or loss of appetite. And they don't feel good. Yeah. No, yeah. Not the pacemaker. And it isn't the pacemaker, unless the weight loss is because the edema is now going because they 
uh, had heart failure. Could it's be. much better with a pacemaker. Can't tell you how much I appreciate your time and your expertise. And we really had a lot of questions. Thank you for your patience here. Thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all your questions and the opportunity to answer them. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. <laughs>